um, just to put things into perspective, um, we're, we're going to do kind of a very high level um, review because I do a lot of this training in the core PM that our company had for several years. And uh, several of these subjects literally are, you know, four to six hour session in themselves. And I'll try to point that out. Um, but this is about winning work all the way from RFP to interview. So it's almost like the, the, the cradle to grave of the winning the work, not performing the work at this point, but it's the winning the work. So uh, I wanted to ask face to face, I would ask how many of you have been involved in winning work in uh, going for a proposal or a pursuit? But the only way for me to see that would be to see a raise of hands or maybe, I don't know, maybe you can help me. But um, I'm going to assume that uh, some of you raised your hands and some of you didn't. <laughs> But I can tell you right now that uh, the chances are almost all of you have been part of uh, a pursuit or winning work. It, it could be part of putting together um, some initial drawings that your uh, manager asked you to do. It could be doing a little research he, he or she asked you to do. And it actually could be just actually, believe it or not, just performing good work and getting a review or that's part of winning work. So um winning work um is everybody has a role um it's just understanding where your role is and and that way you can perform best in that role and i would say when you don't know when you're um participating in a pursuit um that's probably i would hold that responsibility of your uh, project manager whoever's asking you to do something they should always tell you the why and then it gives you that perspective of why you're doing what you're doing so uh, when I first got into kind of um, more of the business development role, I mean, I ran I ran the department years ago, and then I went on and um, I was pretty successful, so I started doing it for the region, and then I'm brought back and I'm more into operations now. But there was a there was definitely a chapter that turned kind of this new paradigm I had of of, of the winning work because I didn't get that. It, you know, when I got out of college, it was all about it was all about engineering. I'm an engineer. That's what I do, right? Um, but this is something that you'll find when you start thinking of winning work. It's not about just winning work and making money. It's it's more. You'll find that it's more thinking what the client needs and what they want. And uh, in there is some engineering, right? But it's bigger than that. And when you start thinking of that, it, it's a big step you'll take in where your role is and how you can really excel in, in in bringing in new work so we're going to go over uh we're going to go over some terms and conditions and just so that we can set the stage i didn't see how many people raised their hands so it's hard for me to determine how many people have what level of experience here but then we're going to go over to go or not to go that's kind of a fancy way i just was trying to say we make go no go decisions which i'm sure some of you have heard then uh, we're going to talk about the hunt that's the capturing. That's finding out what project is and how do you do it. Then there's the catch. That's when we'll go over a little bit of this, uh, what I call it, sizing your net. That's really is, is doing your, your capture planning. OK, and we'll cover that. And then the actual proposal, which is probably half of this uh, presentation is more on the proposal itself. So and the key thing there is making it fit. And that means a proposal is not a proposal is not a proposal. You have to make it fit for your client you know know what they need because if you just do a proposal to do a proposal um you know you're it's like rolling the dice whether or not you'll win uh the job and you just just uh, uh and, and you have to avoid that uh because uh there is expenses to go on this and then we'll just briefly cover interview kind of looking the part and uh that's a good example of a, literally there's a there, i do an hour presentation on just how to interview so obviously, I'm not going to go into that that depth. Um, so that's kind of what we're going to cover today. OK. All right, so. It's a segment of business development. Now, um, it would be good for you to understand. We'll go over kind of definitions and in uh, terms, but in fact, it's not on the slide, but I'm going to I'm going to I'll try to cover the difference between marketing and business development, because when I was your age, I didn't know the difference. <laughs> So, um, but uh, there is a difference. And proposal writing is part of the, uh, the business development. It, it, there is a, there's an expense to it. It's not free. I mean, um, the most expensive thing um, 
that we have in our office is also the thing that brings us the most business and that's your labor right it's so every time you're working um you know we don't sell widgets we sell our ideas and minds so every time we you're working on what we talked about earlier it, it costs money so um it's important if you look at that second bullet is there's there's not always a direct relationship between the proposal investment and the fee there's always got to be that idea of how much am i going to spend how much you know how much am i going to possibly get in in business and so you've got it's got to be a factor we can't get into it too deep here but just consider that a person like um like brian oliver who um you know he can do a 500 hundred dollar proposal um which is nothing on on a job that will bring him a quarter of a million dollars worth of fees and then we have a design build that will spend you know three four five times that so you've always got to factor that in. You've always got to have that probability meter. And we'll cover that when you look at go, no, go a little bit. And then um, the third bullet is, I'll cover that a little bit when we talk about intel gathering. The client, unfortunately, may, may already kind of know who they want. Um, hopefully that's not the case, but the fact is it is sometimes the case. And you'll see a question that comes up in the go, no, go to try to vet that out. You don't always get that answer, but you can kind of try to get a feel for it. If there's an incumbent, if somebody did some initial studies um, and uh, and we'll cover that. And you got to get a vibe on where you are in the field. And we'll cover that um, on one of the slides. Just uh, really quick over some defining some terms. Um, mo I'm sure you guys have heard of RFPs and RFQs, so I won't go into too much depth. Just know the difference. I have to tell you, the industry often calls an RP, an RFQ, an RFQ, an RP. Sometimes it's a little annoying to me is when they, they are different, okay? <laughs> you know, an RP, the, think of the after, the, the, um, the, the last letter in these is P for proposal, Q for qualifications. They are different. Usually qualifications don't have a price. It is important to remember, and again, when I was younger, I didn't know anything about QBS, which is, if you look right here, that's, <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, that's right here. Okay, why did that do that? I used a pen. Pen. Uh, QBS, Brooks Act. That's QBS law. What is QBS? QBS is quality based process selection. So um, I can't get into too much depth there, but it is actually against the law. They are supposed to pick consultants for for servant for services not based on price. Okay, just I'm gonna park that because they can't get into too much. So, um, you know, they can ask for prices on like design build and items like that that are constructing, but they cannot, they can't not hire an engineer and ask you for a price, believe it or not. It, it actually, there's a lot of study behind this. They have to pick you on qualifications and then negotiate a price. So just remember QBS and QBS law. And if you have any questions, we can, um, we can follow up on that. Um, but uh, there are some cities and agencies that violate that law. Whenever they ask you for a price for your strictly your services, it's against the law. OK, um, and um, there's a process. If you have questions at the end, I can kind of it's an interesting process because they can ask you for your price. But you got to put it in a, in, a, in a separate envelope. OK, and guess what? They can't open that envelope until they select you. And guess what? They can't open the second envelope. What they do is they negotiate with you. And then if they cannot come to terms, they say that we cannot pick you uh, because you're too expensive or whatever. Then they can let you go and then they can open the second envelope. Because obviously they can't open the, 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 the second runner up because then, then they know what fee to negotiate with. And, and if they really follow the law, or the rules and guidelines, uh, rules of engagement, is they're supposed to mail the unopened envelopes back to the people that didn't win the project. I went into more depth than I wanted to there, but that gives you an idea of what QBS is. Okay, just real quick, SF330, those of the, you know, if you're gonna do these federal or state projects, it's just a guideline for submitting your qualifications. And obviously they're the government, so they're very regulated. They've had a lot of, they've had more protests than anybody, so they've just structured it. The takeaway here is just to know that we have this vision support. We have all this information that we can go to our proposal department and just being the size of our company, it has just tons of information on projects we've done, locations we've done it in. So just know that if, have we done a job in Bakersfield? Yes, boom, they got a list. 
did we do a bridge in Bakersfield? They have that data. So that's the takeaway there. And the SF-330, the takeaway there is that that's just a form to submit your qualifications. It's structured. Everyone's the same. It's just that you got to put your information in that format. Okay, so that's just kind of terms and terms and understandings, right? So now we'll move into to go or not to go. That is the question. Uh, so this is, um, uh, you know, when you think of a go, no go decision, it's probably not a decision um, that our industry does very well. One of the reasons is, and I'm guilty as charged, uh, we want to, we always think that we can do a project, you know, um, <laughs> I always want to do that project, you know. Um, it's very hard to say no. <laughs> it's very hard, okay. So, but uh, you'll find that when you do make a a no, and you know, a no go decision, they call it a go, you know, go no go decision. So this is basically go. You've seen this. This is no go decision. Uh, Often you'll find that uh, making a no decision, no go decision, you don't, you lose the project, right? Because you don't go for it. It could be the best decision you've ever made and, and time will tell. But if you do your job right, you'll find out usually just park your memory a year from the, in the future um, that um, you'll find out more about the project. Um, it probably was a good decision if you felt it. So the key thing here is to remember, and this is a little bit of my pet peeve is, can we win the project? The operative word here, and it's capitalized, is win the project. Can we win the project? It's very likely we can do the project. In fact, it's very frustrating for me when I go to people and I say, I ask them questions and they answer me with, yes, uh, we can do that. Like, can you, like, um, uh, a bridge that's uh, a suspension bridge. I've never been involved in one, um, but uh, I go um, to my structure engineer internal here, and I say, um, uh, ask him about his experience in 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 suspension bridges, and he says, "Yeah, oh yeah, we can do that." That's not my question. It's can you do? It? Can you win the project? So you can't do the project until you win it. So I don't like the word "can." You know, yeah, we we can do that. You know, we can do that. Okay, I don't want to know if we can do it. I bet you can figure it out. I know you, 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 there's a lot of smart people in this company. I know you can figure it out. But I want to know, can you win it? So in other words, do you have what it takes to, have you done 20 of them? You know, do you sleep and breathe uh, you know, sus suspension bridges? So it's very important um, because this is what builds your go-no-go -no -go decision. Um, if I get the answers of, yeah, yeah, we can do that. Hey, we, we've done that you know, before. Then I start thinking, you know, I don't know if we're going to be able to win this thing. And then you might lean towards the, the very difficult no-go decision. Okay. It's important to know that, you know, what does it take to cost to win is, is it takes seven times more money. I don't know where that number came from, but the point there is that, uh, and I'll come up with a, there's a, a slide a little bit later that shows you the relationship, uh, marketing is that it's very expensive this is the takeaways forget the seven times it's very expensive to win a job for a new client it's relatively inexpensive to get work from an existing client i think it's a 70 30 ratio as far as how our business comes like 70 percent 70 75 percent from repeat clients so that's the takeaway there is just know that it when you're going for a new client it can be very expensive So here's a kind of those those go no go uh, kind of the kind of the checklists or, or questions. Do we know the client? Have we met them? Um, I created this on it's, it's hard to read here, but uh, I created this quick check. I've seen go no go checklists that um, that have like 50 questions in them. The problem with those is that often they're not used because they have so many. So I always try to trim mine to the the vital few, if you will. So it's hard to see, but uh, my quick checks is some questions here um, you can see on the left, but the one that I always I always like to, to think about of, of these, my questions on the right, I'll, I'll, I'll read it to you because it's too small to see. And my pen just doesn't like to work here. Okay. Pen. I'll read it to you because it's hard to see. Um, 
of these questions is some of them are are uh, I always kind of get a vibe for the project manager when we're when we're when we're uh, making a go no go decision. Uh, there's a question here that says. Uh, do you know the competition? And whenever somebody comes back to me and says, um, uh, no, but I can figure it out. I can find out. That's not the answer I want. I already got to if we don't know who the competition is. The question's more important than the answer. I don't need to know that it's Rick Engineering. I need to know that you knew the answer to it, because if you don't know the answer to it, you have not been engaged in this process. The whole thing that's one of the key things about go, no go decisions is that you have to be involved before the damn thing comes out on the street. Um, if, if, if you're responding to an RFP, you got a chance of winning it. But if you know that RFP is coming out six months in advance, that means you know who the competition is. You know that's actually goes right to the point of maybe one of the competition has been engaged with the client for a year on this project. Maybe that goes to that bullet that's on three slides ago that says that they really already know who they want. Well, if they know who they want, and I think they know who they want, then I probably won't go for the project. So you got to know who the competition is and you got to know it before it comes out. The reason I circled and put an asterisk by that one is, and I'll read it to you because it's very small here, is that I always ask people, and don't overthink it. Give me what jump blink, what jumps in mind. From a scale of one to ten, how well positioned are we? Uh, is this team your flash SWAT? So if you know what a SWAT is, a strengths, weaknesses, opportunity. Your flash SWAT jump. What is the answer? And you, I'll get answers like oh it's just six. Seven. No, well then I'm making a go. I'm making a no go. Um, the 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 most important. You usually know the answer and where you rank. And, and if it's not high, see, because if I've done research, if I've done all those things that I told you in advance, I've been tracking the project way before it comes out. I know, you know, who the competition is. You might, nobody's really got a good position on it. I know what the client wants. When somebody asks me that question, what's my flash squad? I'm going to say an eight or nine right away. So again, I always look for the, the response to these um, and how they respond more than actually, you know, specifically what they respond. Um, are there any incumbents that's, you know, do they do they know who they want? So there are these go no go questions, um, but I think uh, it's important to take away is that um, there's only a few that really go no go because like I said, a no go decision is very difficult decision for for us, for us meaning our industry. I've seen it. Uh, just a few more questions here. I don't need to go through all these. You guys can read, but um, uh, there's uh, when you when you're considering a go no go, there's two kinds of risks. Basically, you know, do you have the right PM for the team? You always have to know um, what is the pursuit risk, which is how much money do you risk losing by if you don't win the job? And then there's the the um, uh, the uh, operational risk or the performance risk, they call it. And that's if we do that suspense and bridge, you know, heaven forbid we win. Oh, no. Now we've got a design and we've never we've only done one in the last 20 years. There's a performance risk there. So that is a factor of go, no, go. You have to know what you're doing uh, or you not only may not make a profit because you're going to be learning it. Um, you really risk some serious, uh, um, you know, errors and omissions. And so those all have to be factored into this uh, go, no, go decision. OK. I know we want to do the job, I really do, um, but you got to factor it. So, and then I always look at your differentiators right here. That goes right to the point of, I just don't know, I guess the pen just doesn't go on the first click. You got to click it twice. That goes to the point of, are you going to win it? And we'll talk about differentiators in, in some a few upcoming slides. Time check. All right, the hunt. So, all right, you factored all of that in, and we're uh, we're gonna go. We're gonna go for it because we we've been thinking about this project a long time. We've done you know you know twenty projects like this. Um, so, uh, okay, I'm sorry, I'm ahead of slide. My bad. This is actually when you're still trying to find the work. 
So the hunt is more trying to find that work. This is uh, this is basically uh, when I said that you need to know the work before the RFP comes out. You know, before the RFP comes out. That's that doing that research. So by doing the hunt by in the hunt. When you get asked that question, what are our chances and how well positioned are you going to say eight or nine because you've done all this. So this is what this is about. You have to do client outreach. You have to find out what they need before they ask for it. You have to know the RP is coming out six months before it's coming out. You have to go meet with them. You have to know this is where you become more of a consultant and a, and a, and a trusted advisor by knowing what they need before they ask for it. Um, and then you can start building that capture plan again before the RP comes out. So if you've done all the things on this, you will find that um, you're very well positioned when the RP comes out. And guess what? Then our competition is asking when they address it right when the RP comes out, we're so far ahead of them. It'd be a very hard job from us. And that's why this is so important. And by doing it this way, you're going to know that the cost that you put into the pursuit is going to be well spent. Because why? Because you've increased your odds. There's no guarantees in life, but you've increased your odds. Involve your team. This is important. It's amazing. It's amazing the resources of knowledge that we have in this company. We mentioned vision earlier, but that's just the start. There is so much knowledge in this company as far as two things. Skill sets. Have we done this type of project? Ge geography. Have we done it in this location? But also contacts. You'd be surprised how many people when I just start asking questions about uh, um, projects or, or, or people. Do you know this person? Yeah, I went to college with him. You know, he was my roommate. He was my brother in law. Trust me, you'd be surprised. And nothing guarantees success in this, but the little pieces do. Because is it I always say to myself, I, I, I don't like name droppers. I don't like when um, I go to people and they um, I'll, I'll do this with you know architects. Do you, do you know this client? And they they oh yeah I know that. I, they start name dropping. It's not that you know the person that helps. It helps. It's not that you know the person. It's you know the person, and there's a reason why that's good. It's good because you know what they want, what they like, what they need. Not because you know the person. So do you see the difference there? So it's it's important to know them because you, for a purpose, not just because you know them. And I've had so many name droppers come into me and I said, yeah, I know all these. I'm really connected um, and that's good, but uh, it's not um, it doesn't bring the value in, in, in pursuing unless you know uh, what the client needs. So this is in that lower right. You can see that graphic I was telling you about repeat clients. So, you know, where do we get where do we get the work? Well, the predominant amount of work comes from existing clients. You can see right here. I don't know what studies went through here, but it says 75%. It doesn't matter. The main point is the majority of work comes from, you know, and, and this going from here to here is growing. So your new clients, there's some expenses and that's going to grow a little bit, right? You know, you can go, but really the, the point is, is look at, look at the existing clients. It's the, so, the best way to market that, and it's not even on the slide, is to do good work, right? But um, but uh, in addition to doing uh, doing work well, providing good services, it's also knowing what the client needs. So, and uh, I always teach this at, at SGSU. It's like, yeah, they they, you know, when when a, when a when a city comes out and they have a road project and they're hiring somebody, you know, does that project manager really want the road project? No. Um, he probably wants a raise, right? He probably wants a promotion. You know, he probably wants, uh, you know, you know, baby needs shoes. Getting the road is a means and methods to getting what they want. You have to know what they want. OK, so and you provide if you show them that uh, you're going to make them look good to their boss because you have done 20 roads in this location. And you know the regulatory environment. You've made all of their headaches go away. Somewhere in there is going to be a road design, right? Somewhere in there is going to be a road design. But you have to know what they what they want, and then you can start working into how to uh, differentiate yourselves. 
So uh, the hunt waters capture planning, it's it's the operative word here is is targeted and specific. It's you, you know, you really I, I've had conversations on pursuits for 25, 30 minutes and then found out um, that the person that brought me to pursuit didn't even know who the target client was. We were talking about a uh, um, it was a design build project and uh, he was talking about how well you know, you know uh, about you know how you could get you know talk to the owner which is not bad but he started talking owner 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 which that sounds good right you should always kind of know who the owner is that's good but that wasn't our target client design build for a civil engineer is not going to be the owner it's going to be likely a contractor the contractor's target client's an owner it's very humbling but it's important to know who your client is. I always say, who is your target client? Now, that doesn't mean you can't get to know the owner, know their needs, because then if you know the owner's needs, what can you do? You can then bring value to your to your target client, who's a contractor, and I do this all the time. I tell the client, not that I know somebody at SDSU, but I know what they need, and I talk to the client, and I say they need this and this and this, and I don't do name dropping. I say this is what they need. They really they have a problem with all of their ADA throughout the campus. You fix their ADA problems and you'll be picked. I've just now have I sold myself as a civil engineer for this contractor? Yeah, a little bit, not much. I've sold them as somebody that can help them win. You know, and, and so as engineers, we always try to look at you know the, the engineering and that's very important. But um, but we have to look at um, kind of the purpose of that engine. So anyway, so action items and deadlines this is very important. We'll talk about schedule uh, in a little bit here. But um, but when you do the capture planning, we'll talk about building the pursuit team as well. And about three slides from now. The advantage of capture planning, I got to tell you, we this is something we can always get better at because I've got literally I've, we've got um, what they call a box and I think Shark calls it a nine box. Um, uh, we use a red font on projects that need a strategic pursuit. They need a capture plan. Not all projects need a capture plan. You know the 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 you know the clients that are repeat clients those usually don't need capture plan, right? Because we know good services you keep those client relationship relationships. You know what they want. Um, they'll come back to you in a lot of cases. That's that repeat existing clients, right? New clients usually need a capture plan. So you have to think, and, and engineers don't do this enough, strategically. You have to think strategically. So prior, remember, you see how it's redundant? I'm talking prior to the release. Intelligence. Are you guys familiar with Sun Tzu, the art of war? I can't see raised hands. It's so much better when we do this in person. But Sun Tzu, the art of war, right? One of them is, is espionage, right? Intel, Intel, Intel. If I get intelligence, I went once a few years ago. I asked a project manager who came in and said we wanted to pursue this. I said, okay, uh, do some research, find out this, this, and this. And he asked me, why do I need to know that? And I said, you know something? I don't know. But when you find those, it'll let me know what the next question is. It's a snowball effect. Get intel, not intel, not all intel is valuable, right? You're not going to get, not, but when you get intel, it will grow intel. I don't know what the questions are right now. Get me some intel. I've got 10 questions, okay? So get the intel, find out things, and you, you'd be surprised at what curiosity and a little bit of intelligence that you get some intel out there, um, you'll find it's almost logarithmic. You'll get more questions. And the more questions you get, the more answers you'll build and the more differentiating you'll do to the client, the more you'll meet their needs because you know what they need before they ask for it. I always tell people that when you reply to an RFP, you can't just reply what's required. You need to read. I always say you need to read between the lines of an RFP. Not the lines of the RFP. The lines of the RFP will tell you what's required. And we'll talk about that. will be a lot of the proposal that we'll talk about. But to win the job, you got to read between the lines. And then if you give them more than the minimum they asked for, that'll differentiate you. Okay. 
bring on uh, sub consultants early. Uh, you'd be surprised. It says lock them in, and there's another slide later that says lock them in. Um, that's a subject that can be in depth. Uh, yeah, it's great to lock in your team. Um, you always have to have a reason on their part. You always have to even just like you think like the client, you got to think like the sub consultant. You know, why would they lock in with us? Because they know we're the winning team. That's a, a conversation for another day. But but getting them early, multiple reasons of getting them early. Intel, Intel. They, you'd be surprised how much our, our sub consultants know that we don't know. It's it's it's. I love it because you'll find out how much information they know. It really is fun. As you can tell, I like what I do. Um, all right. So now here's the catch. So this is what I was trying to. I was trying to do it with a little bit more power and strength. <laughs> but uh, so the catch. Okay. So it's a go. You've made the go decision. So now you need to get your proposal team and all this. Now I have a couple uh, diagrams here, and you, aren't they just pretty? Um, these are ones that I've marked up over the years that kind of give you a relationship um, between the stages of a pursuit. Okay, so um, I can't go into too much depth. There's questions later again, because these are like an hour session by themselves. There's like four stages of pursuits. I won't get into stage five, which isn't as needed, but it's stage one, two, three, four, and five. So um, basically one and two, one is like a year out or so. Uh, but you know about it before the RP comes out, right? That's the stage one. That's why stage one is so important. You don't have, you don't start with stage two. Trust me, lots of people start with stage two. I've started with stage two, stage two before. It's not good, okay? But stage two, the RP comes out. Uh, stage three, you, you're now pursuing it. You've made that go. To, now you're in the uh, in the funnel. That's stage three. And then if you win the job, you know, congrats to stage four. So. Uh, why are those important? Because if you look up above this beautiful chart that I drew several years ago, it gives you a little bit of the relationship. By the way, that's proprietary. I don't think anybody's ever, um, I, I just threw all the stuff that I knew about our company and the industry and I kind of put in kind of the roles. So what I'm trying to say is that's proprietary and it also is probably not exactly correct. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm baking in a disclaimer there. <laughs> so I just drew this because I wanted to get the relationship of what do I do as a project manager and what does our sales lead do and what does the proposal development department do? So as you can see, stage one, two, three, four is across the horizontal axis. When you're stage one and two, you can see where the sales lead, uh, here, I'll get my pen, is very high. It's very high, uh, come on now. Uh, uh, you know, I'll try a highlighter. Dude, the highlighter looks black. I don't want to do that. Okay, so if you can see right here at the beginning of stage one. Oh, come on. Pen. Pen. It's, it's very high over here. See this? When, you, when you're stage one, you just go up, it's high. So the sales lead is really highly involved. They're doing the research. They're doing the intel. They're doing all that. Then when they get to stage two and the RP comes out, you know, then then you've got to start getting your your your, your proposal lead and your, your project managers more involved. There's a point of equilibrium here. I said a point of equal participation. And then after that, you've really got to start getting your project team really involved here because that's when they start doing the, um, the technical evaluations. And we'll touch on that again, high level. Um, they have to start ramping up and really digging in on the technical narratives and really getting into means and methods and how you do the job and how I'm going to convince this client that I can do the job. I can convince this client that all of their headaches are going away by hiring me. They hire me, they don't have to worry about the roads end because all their headaches go away. The sales lead's not gonna do that, okay? The sales lead's gonna, gonna get you positioned to, to, to win, but uh, the taking it home is, is really where the design. And that's where a lot of you probably have been involved and you didn't even know it. A lot of you probably involved over here and you didn't even know it. Thank you for that. So uh, I love this part where it says, uh, you know, it's, it's a it's a team sport. That's where you do build your team, the proposal team, the design team. But remember that it is about the client. It's not about us. I always come back to that, that um, when you enter, well, we'll talk about interviews a little bit later, but when you're putting this together, it's counterintuitive, believe it or not. It's not how, you know, it's not how good you are. Uh, you need to be good. 
right? The problem is all of your competition is good too. Most of them are. So it's about the client. Why? Okay, so it's because I'm good. What does that bring to the client? And when you can verbalize that and write that and put it in a technical narrative, then you've separated the fact that you just are a great engineer. You've now stated, no, no, this and because of that, I can do this. I know you you have those hot buttons of fire. Your your fire access is a, is a hot button. So you talk about this hot button. So it's the why. It's the why is that being a good engineer and knowing your industry good to them? Now, the chances are your competition probably can do that almost as good as you. They're not the same. But if you explain that to the client, again, you're going to that part of making all of their worries go away. Okay. So the, 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 the building blocks of differentiators, what do you think those are? The building blocks of differentiators are the hot button. We've been kind of touching on it. Not your hot buttons. The client's hot buttons. What bother him? What keeps him up at night? Those are the building blocks to your differentiators. Once you find out that they know they have um, they have no funding, they're low on funding, or they know that they really have a problem with getting permits through Caltrans because you're dealing with the city of San Diego. Once you know the the hot buttons, then you aren't just telling them that you're a good engineer. You're telling them, I know how to get through Caltrans. You got no Caltrans problems, you come to me. So you got to find out what their hot buttons are in order to find out how to address their hot buttons. And once they feel you can handle their hot buttons, that's how you differentiate yourself. How do you get hot buttons? Intel, Intel, Intel. You get the research, you find out what their hot buttons are. You, you look at what they were sued on. You look at what projects are buying schedule. Tons of things you can do. I'm gonna do a time check here. Ooh, my, my, my watch just ran out of juice. What time is it right now? We're about 12.47. I gotta roll, I gotta, oh boy, I gotta, I gotta pick up the pace. Assembling your team. Those of you that know me and actually were students of mine know that I'm a big fan of, you know, keeping the ends in mind. You have to think about who your project team is going to be when you're assembling your team. You obviously have to know what the scope is and try to fit it. Remember, if somebody says that they can do something, beware. You know, ask them, you know, their experience and ask them, you know, um, because when you ask the question, can you help me win it? You're embedded in that question are differentiators. They, they can help you win it because not only have they done a bridge, they did a bridge just down the road there and they know exactly the permit process. And I, by the way, I hope they don't sound pessimistic. I get a lot of good answers um, when I ask those questions because there's, like I said, there's a wealth of information in this company, man. You'd be surprised. I am usually. So other things, sub consultants, remember um, that they bring more, <coughs> excuse me, they bring more than just their skills, just like you bring more than just an engineer. They bring their brain. They bring their knowledge. They bring their knowledge of uh, the client. They bring their knowledge of uh, the client's needs and knowledge of that specific project. And of course, they can always DVB. These are just I. These all together disadvantaged business enterprises. There's women owned. There's you know there's a uh, veteran owned. Um, you have to know um, what those are to meet your needs. Staying on track, this is where you really get, this is where the one of the huge benefits of our proposal department, they're really good at, at ripping into an RRP and knowing what's needed, and they really help you in setting the schedule for things and uh, for, you know, the process. Um, so you, when you get them involved, and I, you know, I go to Char and Char gets them involved, all right? So I would suggest not getting, you know, when you get to this, because um, Char's awesome, and, um, you know, she, she definitely, she's our go-between. OK, the catch, you know, get a strong net, you know, focus on the submittal. Um, uh, this is where a lot of you are involved. Remember that curve going up? You'll, you'll see it on the next slide. I copied that curve again on the next slide. When that curve starts going up and you start getting a design team involved, 
you know, Char doesn't write design narratives. I write design narratives. Char doesn't write a proposal fee. I write a proposal fee. Um, you know, Char's, you know, pulls our qualifications and all that, the vision. She's just uh, amazing at what she can pull there. But, um, but you have to focus on this middle and the scope, concept designs, understanding the client's expectations. Mountain department's not going to do that. In most cases, Char does it for me a little bit because um, I'm kind of needy and she knows it. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, but uh, that's really kind of the, the job of the, the, uh, your research. Okay, here's this chart again because uh, it's really the, we're knowing where the proposal team is and what the design and project manager say. So there's that difference between pursuing something and the actual operations, you know, how to perform it. So that's the operations and the performance or how you, you know, the, that's the building block. Knowing that is the building block of writing your technical um, proposal. So remember, the best uh, the best way, and I, I've told this to, to my students, the best way, it's called just methodology and approach. You know, it's the, the building blocks is, of that is your work breakdown structure. When it comes right down to it, if you convince your client that you know how to do everything, uh, then you get hired because they don't want to do it. Chances are you know it better than they do in most cases. Proposal, making it fit. Um, you know, this is where the proposal department really, because, you know, engineers aren't, aren't the best on graphics, um, as you can see with my incredibly bad handwriting and those charts and all that. But uh, that's proprietary, you know. <laughs> um, but they really bring the right brain in. Just know that uh, as engineers, we have, we have left brains uh, more than right brains. We need that right brain. I've given Hillary bullet points and garbage and she pulls out flowers. She gives me back flowers. And I mean, um, and uh, on anything you're doing, remember, you've got to get that right brain and graphics going. Um, I'm, I always have mixed. I'm always a big fan of good cover letters. Um, there's like a four hour session just on this, so I can't go into that left that depth. But um, let me just say this. I've mixed you cover letters often aren't part of the evaluation process. OK, so let me just um, focus on this. People don't like to read. People don't read. I'm telling you that right now. How do you don't? I got RFPs that are 2000 pages long. I got one that was 2200 pages long last week. OK, I can't read that much. Right. So you have to make it easy for them. You know, on a different side, I can give you a sample of my cover letters. I use some, they don't do it very well here, and they don't do it very well here in these, and you can get some takeaway here. I use bolding and underlining. Um, I probably do too much, but um, I know that you've heard of reverse engineering, right? Consider reverse reading. If you bold something, people won't read the sentence. They'll see the bold, and then they'll read the sentence backwards to figure out what the hell you're trying to say. So there's a lot of power in focusing on their needs, using, just have the realization people don't read, so make it easy to read. Make it, and trust me, I've been, in, I've been on the side where I've actually, we've actually been hired to evaluate proposals of our competition. I've seen Rick Engineering, NAS, I've seen their proposals. Uh, the goods have to jump off the page, okay? You can't bury it in text and narratives when you're writing. You're not writing a novel. So with the cover letters, you've got to have things jump off the page. I'm a big fan of little dialogue boxes, bullets, meet Tarzan, you Jane language and some of those bullets, right? It's got to jump out of them because they'll read that. And by the way, when I was evaluating those technical proposals, they gave me 10. You know what it worked out to on the budget they gave me? 20 minutes per there's no way you could read those in 20 minutes. It, it, and by the way, I spent, you know, probably double or triple that just I put in my own time because I was serving a client and I didn't, you know, and I'll tell you, um, know that is what I'm trying to say. Know that. And if you know that, you'll write your documents and make them so that they can do it in 20 minutes. Have it jump off the page. Can you stand apart? Um, this is where um, your subs can take an advantage. And let me just, I got to move, move on here. Um, you can tell this is the first time I've done this one. This is all about differentiating. Right here, uh, again, it comes down to know 
know what's important to the client on a different level. Think like the client. You guys remember the old Star Trek, how Spock used to do a mind meld? The true empathy. Think like the client. When you think like the client, do your intel, you, the answers will come to you. And I did this little, uh, I did this little uh, quick check value proposition calendar uh, calculator. This is actually a calculator, by the way. I can't get into it, but if you, you just answer these questions, and if you answer them, then you realize you can evaluate how high you evaluate. It's a very quantitative way to evaluate qualitative information, which is tough to do. Um, but if you play with this, it's pretty fun. You can figure out, you know, if you know that that certain one of these are their hot buttons, you know how to position yourself. This goes back to the focus part is uh, it's not just a boilerplate. Just remember when I said earlier, a proposal is not a proposal is not a proposal. Lots of people put them in there. Lots of people I've seen them take an old proposal and not even do a search on the old project name. For God's sakes, if you do that, at least search. I always do a search list. That's your starting point. Boilerplates are a starting point. Don't think they're more than that. After that, you have to start um, specializing them to fit the project, the project needs, and what more importantly even, the client needs, what they want, okay? Be, be clear and concise. That just comes down to the point of, you know, cut to the chase. This is really kind of ticking me off that, that I got to hit that that pen twice and three times. Be clear and concise, you know, um, cut to the cut to the chase. Um, yeah, it just goes over minimums. Relevant experiences where they ask you for project experience and all that. You try to make it fit. By the way, I'll say on this, on project experience, when you, um, the titles of projects, the takeaway on this is you come up with the title. They, you know, they don't know the title of your project you did two years ago. So if I did a, uh, a, um, a parking structure and dorm, and I'm going for a parking structure on the next one, I'll call it the parking structure at, you know what I mean? So, so, so when you do your project experience and you're using those rep projects, you can tailor it to fit their needs, okay? You're not changing the project. The project is what it is. You're just highlighting it. So um, wh what are you doing if you do that? You're basically, you're thinking like the owner. You're thinking what they want. I already talked about this a little bit. Technical approaches, this is the means and method. You have to know methodology and approach on, on all of it. And if you can convince them of that, you can convince them that their headaches go away. The project uh, proposal, um, the key word here is, is specific. Um, and I would say, it says description of the tasks, um, you know, use, use the RFP as, as the low bar and then read between the lines. Um, comes with a lot of experience, but you'll learn from yourself when you do these. You know, you, sometimes your best um, trainer is, is, uh, is yourself, just a more mature self. Um, always look to learn from your experiences. And then cost is a factor. Um, you know, this is um, when it's a factor. It shouldn't be in most of our cases. In design build it is because they're constructing something. In most cases, um, it should not be a factor. Um, but uh, you have to know uh, what your industry competition, you know, prices are. Uh, this is where the proposal development part really helps us out because there are there are red team review and they're 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 basically really good at making sure that everything in an RFP is is um, is checked off. They're really good at this. They'll check that everything is that, that literally that it's the stamp is is in the right place that you know that the envelope has the right thing written on it um because i said it's the low bar because you got to think of all the other stuff but if you miss something and it's happened uh you did all this great stuff and methodology and approach and then if you didn't do the low bar it's, it's it's happened it can be very disappointing so 
QC review, Q, have other people review it. The proposal development partner is really good at reviewing documents for us. And then the interview, this is this last two slides, is the interview. Um, the main take on an interview is, and let me just take this and I'll end it in this because I know we're running out of time here, is the bottom line in the interview is you've already turned in everything. They've already analyzed everything. The interview comes down to, do they want to work with you? It's very personal. You know, your competition is, um, you know, they're all good. So you have to look the part. You have to be that convincing, soothing, whatever they want. That may be humorous sometimes. You got it. That's some people. But when it comes around to it, they have to walk away going, ah, they're all qualified. They're all really good. But you know what? I really want to work with Kevin. That's what the interview is about. It is the sale of, you know, of yourself. And um, because the bottom line is all of our competition are pretty damn good engineers. And like I said, this is literally an hour lecture in itself on interviews, which I obviously can't cover here. I'll say one thing about a dry run. Let me just say one thing about a dry run. Um, always do them. Here's the good news and bad news about a dry run. They're painful. They're awkward. You're talking to your bosses. You're practicing in front of people that have heard you say it two or three. They're terrible. They're tough. Always do them. And the good news is the real thing is always better than a dry run. They just always are. Talking to real people that haven't heard, they're always better. So just know that when you're going through the painful dry run. The painful dry run will help you get and work out those things. And uh, the real thing's always better. So just know that. And that's about it. So we went over some real quick terms. We went over to go, no, go decisions, kind of the caption work, how to find work, how to think like the client, sizing that, catching it, the capture planning of it. We just scratched it, didn't go into much depth. And then the proposal, the 12 elements there, we went through very fast, but um, the elements of the proposal. And then we had one slide on, a, on an interview. Um, but uh, so that's it. I'm sorry, I, I, like I said, this was, I was wanted to go 40 minutes and I went like, um, I went. 50 minutes.